selamat siang uh, Good afternoon, good morning um, Today we have the honor of a, a, a lecture by Professor Julie Willis She is the Dean of uh, University of Melbourne uh, Which faculty is design? Architecture Building and Planning Architecture Building and Planning um, So uh, let, let us uh, some, uh, hear some short introduction by herself, maybe later, uh, before the, this uh, lecture on uh, architecture and the modern hospital. Uh, Professor Willis is also expert in uh, architectural heritage, uh, among other things that uh, she will present today. Okay, without further ado, please. Uh, sorry. for having me today. Uh, I may sit if that's okay, yeah. uh, then I can see my screen. I hope you can hear me. So today I'm going to talk to you about research that I completed uh, with some colleagues um, that we prepared for this book, uh, Architecture and the Modern Hospital. Um, it looks at the development of the hospital as a type across the 20th century and how architecture plays a very large role in the changing nature of the hospital and indeed the changing nature of medical care during that time. Hospitals in the 19th century uh, faced a, had an innovation when Florence Nightingale, the very famous nurse, designed a hospital ward which was to minimise infection between patients. And we're looking here at a so-called Nightingale Ward uh, in Woolwich in England, that, which became the standard unit for designing hospitals, the ward unit. It had a certain number of beds in it, it had a certain number of windows, uh, certain distances between the beds. It was a very regulated and regimented space. And until the 1920s, this was the standard hospital design uh, pretty much across the world. So in my own home city of Melbourne, uh, the former Royal Melbourne Hospital, built in 1913, has these Nightingale wards stacked on top of each other uh, to create what is called a pavilion hospital. Uh, each of these wards was self-contained. It had its services uh, all contained next to the wards. They didn't have large laundries or large kitchens. The nurses in those units were to look after their patients, to do, prepare the food, uh, to do all the washing, uh, and so they were like little hospitals uh, all stacked up on top of each other. But my research is really a story about how the hospital changes, and I became very fascinated about it uh, by um, looking at the career of one architect who is sitting down in the middle of this photograph. If I use my cursor, it won't come up. Uh, he's sitting in the middle. Uh, his name is Arthur Stevenson. Now, Arthur Stevenson had um, a very interesting career. He came from quite uh, a poor background, um, and he wasn't able to study architecture. Oh, thank you very much. So he's just here. Uh, he wasn't able to study architecture when he left school. He was apprenticed to a builder. Uh, but like many young men, uh, he, was, he enlisted to fight in World War I, and that gave him opportunities that he didn't have previously. One of those opportunities was at the end of the war, the Australian government decided that they needed to get um, the military people into civilian life as fast as possible. So they offered them the opportunity to go and study at various institutions. And Arthur Stevenson got the opportunity to study at the Architectural Association in London in 1919. It meant that he was able to take up his architectural training, uh, he made a lot of connections, uh, and then he came back to Melbourne to set up one of Australia's uh, most important firms, Stevenson and Turner. And the early work that they were involved in uh, included a number of key hospitals. This one, the Children's Orthopaedic Hospital in Frankston, outside of Melbourne uh, of 1927, 
at that stage, uh, taking the latest ideas uh, from hospitals, which I'll explain uh, from the United States. You can see there the children lined up on the balcony. Uh, they're mostly suffering uh, orthopedic issues such as tuberculosis and um, uh, polio. Uh, so they are uh, usefully employed. So they do work as they lie in their beds in the sunshine on the balcony. In 1926, a very important American doctor had come to Australia to talk about the uh, improvement of the Australian hospital um, system. His, his name was Dr Malcolm McKeekin and he came in 1926 and he had a special meeting in Melbourne about uh, architecture for hospitals. Arthur Stevenson was at that meeting and he, Stevenson suddenly realised that the Australian governments were about to put a very large amount of money into hospitals and that if he be, could become the world expert on this, he would make a, a very successful practice for himself. So he did something very unusual. He went to his bank manager and said, I want to go overseas for a year studying hospitals, but I don't have the money, so you lend it to me and I'll come back and make a great success of my practice. And his bank manager lent him the money. So Stevenson went to the United States and visited over 150 hospitals, bringing the most uh, up-to-date ideas into his practice. So this hospital bring, draws on some of those American ideas, uh, particularly the Spanish mission or Mediterranean styles that were popular at the time. He also worked on this building, the Jesse McPherson Wing at the Queen Victoria Hospital in 1928, which uses uh, American skyscraper Gothic modes but it's very innovative because the Americans were exceptionally good at the most efficient ways of running hospitals. So this building had a very large central laundry and a very large central kitchen, the first in hospitals in Australia. And it marks this starting point of uh, a renovation or evolution in the design of hospitals that moves them towards what's called the modern hospital, which is a particular type. He travelled again in 1932 to get more information. This is the point of the Great Depression in Australia and of course worldwide. Uh, and this time he went to Europe where he again saw hundreds and hundreds of hospitals travelling around. And to give you an idea, he went to Italy, Switzerland, um, Germany, France, Russia, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, uh, Denmark, the Netherlands, and um, the UK in this trip. He went to study to do this building, uh, St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, but as you can see, its outside is still very much in that American skyscraper mode. But its inside had innovations that were brand new. Uh, the ward you can see there is no longer the ward of Nightingale's design, but this is a Riggs ward, um, which is considered one of the most uh, um, up-to-date. Uh, it's taken from a Scandinavian hospital uh, system. But soon we were to see um, much more change. And I really like this view of the nurses looking out from the old Royal Melbourne Hospital up to the new one, uh, which is to be built on the hill near, near the university, now not so new hospital, but then very new. And it's this idea of the, the new hospital, which is what I want to talk about, that uh, is a beacon of hope uh, changing uh, populations for the better, uh, bringing health and hygiene uh, to the world. And that's, this is the ideal of hospitals at this time. So I'm now going to talk about the different styles that hospitals are, at this time are being built in. So if we look at the United States, this is all happening in the 1930s. <coughs> In the United States, we have key uh, hospital designing firms. They're very expert at it. So uh, Schmidt, Garden and Ericsson are a leading hospital design firm, but they are still designing hospitals that look like this, that have very traditional language. They thought of hospitals like hotels, uh, and they thought of them as having home-like interiors. So the way that they attracted patients in was to make it as familiar in terms of design as possible. Even though the 
the services might be as efficient as they uh, possibly could be and to be very innovative. Other examples like this that still draw on the Gothic uh, are much more about skyscraper design, the New York Cornell Medical Center uh, by Pauli Shepherd, Shepley, Bullfinch and Abbott, another um, hospital specialist firm. This one taking up a whole city block in New York, uh, an enormous city of a hospital, um, but still in this traditional language. Even this one, uh, the Columbia Presbyterian, uh, by James Gamble Rogers of 1928 still uses or refers to a traditional language of architecture instead of the modernism from Europe which is coming. But Stevenson had the opportunity to see uh, the very, very new hospitals that are coming out of Europe at the time. Hospitals like this one, the Hôpital Bourgeon by uh, Walter Parsi and Cassin of 1932-5. Uh, which is starting to use a much more modernist language. But more importantly, examples like this one, the Zonestrad Sanatorium in Hilversham in the Netherlands by Dauka and Vive. Uh, this one started in 1925, one of the earliest uh, sanatoriums or hospitals who use the uh, modernist language that becomes uh, so prevalent. This is a building that he described as uh, extreme originality uh, and he greatly admired the fact that all the services were contained behind glass and in the bottom right hand corner you can see there the boiler room encased in glass that he admired so much. This building of course was about welcoming sunshine into buildings because there was a very good reason for this. This building was to be a sanatorium for the diamond workers of Amsterdam uh, and when they got tuberculosis. And of course at this time, there is no treatment for tuberculosis such as penicillin. And so the treatment has to be sunshine, fresh air, good food. There's not much they can do for the patients. So this is all about providing sunshine and a healthy environment uh, for the patients. This is a point in which architecture is seen as being uh, part of the therapy for patients. We also see that in Richard Docker's Weiblingen Hospital near Stuttgart of 1928, where the patients are wheeled out onto the balconies every day to get that sunshine. Uh, and he, Stevenson visited this building. He was very impressed by the triple hung sash windows that slid it up to provide this uh, open space from ward through to balcony. And this is what he saw, revolution, these buildings. This one, the Loris Portal in Bern in Switzerland by Salzburg and Breckwell, uh, also embracing sunshine uh, and these clean forms of architecture, very functional, uh, uh, very simple, uh, but focused on the healing for particular patients. This one, the State Krankenhaus or the State Hospital in Vienna by uh, Jutman and Ries of 1929-31, he also thought of as uh, most beautiful and you can see he describes it as a lesson of beauty and form of colour because every different element of the building was picked out in a different colour and the very large balcony you can see there at the top had an enormous glass wall that angled up uh, to allow the most amount of sunshine and fresh air into these, uh, this building. Of course, the most famous example of this kind of architecture is Alva Alto's Paenio Sanatorium um, in, uh, um, in Finland. But the Paenio Sanatorium is in fact a much later building than some of these other examples that I'm showing you. And in fact, when Stevenson visited it, he visited it before it was complete. And it's an interesting story about how modernism picks up its icons. This one becomes the famous one. The others are not so famous, uh, but this one's a little bit later. Stevenson, to talk about a little bit the story of him, comes back to Melbourne and starts to design buildings like this. The Mercy Hospital started in 1933, which takes many of those uh, ideas from the Loris Spital, uh, from Weiblingen, 
uh, and from uh, the Hilversham, uh, the Zonestral Sanatorium at Hilversham, uh, to combine into this building, which also incorporates the best of American planning, uh, functional and efficiency with uh, large laundries uh, and kitchens and so on and so forth. Uh, there it is uh, as it's built, uh, and you can see those glassed-in corners at the end about creating what are called solariums, places in which people can be exposed to the sunlight when the weather's not very nice. So in our book, we look, about, look at the changing nature of, and design of these hospitals over time, the story of Arthur Stevenson and his journey around the world, and Stevenson is important internationally because he's the first person to write about the modern European hospitals in an American context uh, and to promote uh, ideas back and forth across the world. The hospitals that are designed in the late 1930s in Australia are world leading. Um, they are combining elements of hospitals into this new type uh, for the first time anywhere in the world. No one else has the opportunity to really build at this time, so it's a, it's a, a quirk of faith that uh, it happens in Australia. So when we were looking uh, to, for, at this book, we decided to look at the design of the hospital from a number of different viewpoints. And I'm going to take you through those that, today because it talks about um, how design or architecture can make a very big difference to uh, a hospital but also they become part of the treatment or therapy uh, in a hospital. And those ideas that become, they're very important in the hospital context then flow out to the wider world. Uh, but they often have their start in the hospital. So one of the first things that we look at is the relationship of the bed. The bed is the unit by which hospitals are generally um, decided how large they are. A 50 bed hospital, 250 bed hospital. The bed is where the patient is located and it's the way, it's the point from which they uh, are treated, they're engaged, they're, and in this period of time in the, in the 20th century, the patient is put into the bed as soon as possible and that is where they are treated. But one of the things that happens at this point in time, it might seem silly, but beds are given wheels and they can start to move the bed around the hospital. So the bed becomes a mobile site of treatment. Here we see it at um, the Zurich Heights Clinic in Cloverdale in Switzerland, where the bed is placed next to the view so that the patient can have the, the best benefit from seeing the outside, enjoying it, getting some sunshine which has therapeutic benefit to them. I've shown you already the Vibegen Hospital, but here we can see uh, the hospital, the, the, that relationship of bed to outside, where it moves in and out of the wall. Uh, it's, um, this particular hospital is promoted very much by Siegfried Gideon in his um, seminal book, and I know there are German speakers in the room, so I will apologise for my appalling uh, pronunciation. Uh, Befreit's Wohnen, Lit Luft Aufnahm, which is a very important book that talks about the, the importance of light, air and dwelling. Sunlight, sunshine uh, also becomes, uh, you've seen it, we talk about it in terms of balconies, but the glass that is used becomes important. They know that UV, ultraviolet light, can kill bacteria. Uh, so this is about exposing patients to that important therapy of ultraviolet light. Even, uh, it's not only for tuberculosis, but various skin diseases such as psoriasis are uh, effectively treated by ultraviolet light, so it becomes very important at the time. So the position of the bed is important, but the technology of the bed is also important at this time. And we can see on the left here the design of uh, what is a gatch bed, designed by, um, so that the patient can be moved uh, into particular positions. I won't go into all the details, but there are certain things that bodies can only do in certain positions, uh, and the GATCH bed helps that occur. So when you have a patient who is only in bed, it does need to be able to move to these different positions. And you can see uh, the rather extraordinary circular electric 
bed there, which allows for patients, orthopaedic patients, uh, to be moved into all sorts of different uh, positions. And these are some of the innovations of design that come through uh, to the hospital bed itself. The operating theatre is another site of great innovation. Operations, surgical, surgery needs to have sufficient light for it to be conducted. So we see here a 1902 example where a very large window is placed so that the maximum light can come in so the surgeon can see what they are doing. And then there are banks of seating up the sides so that the, medic, the doctors can observe and learn. So when we say an operating theater, it is this theater of observation. I also really like this photograph, so I have to show it. But that idea of, oh, I should just go back. These, this meant that the need for light in these spaces meant that the operating theatres needed to be at the top of the buildings. So they were always placed at the top of hospitals so that they could get skylight uh, illumination. And it also helped reinforce the idea that the surgeon was the king of the hospital, the leader of the hospital, the most important doctor. But as electric light came in, uh, they, they, it loses the need for those very large windows and skylights. Uh, so we see uh, the design of lighting in the operating theatre to become very important. And this uh, design, this hospital in particular, which is by Albert Kahn, uh, is quite important because this one also uses green tiles and grey walls uh, for optimum surgical conditions. Now there are a couple of reasons why this is important. I'm probably best to go on to my next slide. Colour becomes incredibly important in the operating theatre uh, for the reasons I'll explain. Pamuel L. J. Flagg, uh, who is an anaesthetist, writes about it in the architectural record and very helpfully shows the colours uh, that you need to have the optimum uh, conditions in the operating theatre. When electric lighting came in, what happened is that it was essentially too bright. So when the surgeon would look down at the patient and they would be having drapes over them, probably white, and they're looking at the patch of skin which they're doing the incisions, if they looked away from that, they would get something that is called retinal fatigue. But you might know it as when you look at a very bright light, you look away and you can see it's still in your, on your retina. And this is what was happening to the surgeons. And they would go back and look and they could not see the colour of the blood of the patient properly or the colour of the skin. So Flagg talks about, as an anaesthetist, he needs to know how healthy his patient is while they are anaesthetised. And he needs to see the colour of the blood and the skin correctly. He determines that the appropriate colour for the drapes and the walls is green because it is the complementary colour to red, the red of blood. So when the surgeon looked away or the anaesthetist looked away at the green, they could look back and see the appropriate colour. So what happens is that then the green becomes a normal part of the operating theatre. They make green drapes, green clothes, green walls, green equipment. Everyone will be familiar with the hospital green, but this is where it comes from and this is why it comes from. So here we have a design decision that is made uh, that becomes very important in the hospital itself. They were also very much about trying to design innovative operating theatres for maximum illumination uh, and maximum hygiene. This is a model operating theatre, it was never built, by Carl Erickson, who was another hospital spe specialist. And he designs an elliptical paraboloid. You can see the shape, an egg-like shape, uh, for the operating theatre. And what he's doing is separating those who are observing so the students can look in but not be in the space of the operating theatre. The lighting can be set into the wall and focus in on the patient itself. Getting distance for the lighting away from the patient is important because 
there's a great da danger of fire at that point in time because they, the anaesthetic gas they use is ether and it can explode. They also use oxygen which also can explode if the humidity of the space is bright and if there are sp uh, sparks of electricity, either sparks from static electricity from the floor or from the lights itself. So they do a lot of separation of lights to do this. They also bring in air conditioning so that they can manage the risk of fire or explosion uh, and they can also manage the state of the patient because an anaesthetised patient can't control their body temperature uh, so they need to keep the temperature of the um, space uh, close enough to body temperature uh, so the patient doesn't go into shock. So all of these things are working to create what they think of as ideal operating conditions. And there are examples built of this. Here's one in Sydney by Arthur Stevenson, and it has a hemispherical ceiling uh, to allow these things to occur. Um, and I'm, I have a conundrum, a problem that I didn't know about because I've been into this space, and it has the cardinal points of the compass in the floor, set into the floor. And I didn't know why until someone came up to me and said, I think it's because uh, the surgeon needs to say, I need that piece of equipment over there at the west or the south. So people need to know what the direction is uh, and so they set it into the floor. We see another example here in France, uh, this one by Paul Nelson at Saint-Lô, uh, where it's another egg-shaped operating theatre, I believe still in use, with every single light individually controlled. I think it gets quite robotic. <coughs> but such were the, this idea of this melding together of um, design and uh, ho medical need in these particular hospitals. There are other needs in hospitals that are important and um, they are perhaps less obvious than the treatment or care for a surgical patient or someone with um, tuberculosis. They are simply the servicing needs of these hospitals. So they have to have their own electricity plants to run because all of the new machines such as x-ray machines require a lot of electricity. They're starting to build large air conditioning plants and so on and so forth, electrical light. And so their power plants and incinerators become part of the design of these buildings as well. Here's uh, the, to give you a size of the idea of the size of the electrical plants, here's one at the uh, New York Cornell Medical Center in New York, uh, where they're creating their own electricity. They're also creating steam and hot water, uh, which are essential parts of um, the operations of the hospital, which are reticulated around the hospital. Giant laundries, this one, um, again, the New York Cornell Medical Center, uh, where they're managing huge amounts of uh, <coughs> laundry. Uh, you need to think that for every patient in a bed, there is at least four sets of sheets, one to be on the bed, one to be in the wash, one to be in repair, and one to have a spare. Uh, so that they have to, and they're often changing sheets several times a day, they need to be incredibly efficient about the movement of laundry around the hospital. Uh, and so it becomes this giant industrial operation. So does the preparation of food for the patients, and this, while it doesn't look like it, is a kitchen on an industrial scale. They're all electrical pots that they can cook in uh, to create the thousands of meals that they would uh, have every day in one of these very large hospitals. And the hospitals really became like a city in themselves. We see here the Royal Melbourne Hospital uh, designed on the left hand side, you can see the power plant, laundry and boiler room there, built so large that it could service and did service several hospitals. It has a nurse's wing, the nurses are living in on site, uh, and then the hospitals, this also includes a medical research institute. And this hospital uh, became world leading when it was opened in 1942 and had international um, 
uh, fighting this, uh, uh, we see it in the French journals, we see it in English journals, uh, as it became very, very famous. But the hospital uh, wasn't just going to be one hospital on the site, there were going to be seven hospitals, this is the proposal, where they would have all these different specialist hospitals uh, and accommodation all around it. Um, that the hospital is a city in itself. <coughs> We see that here um, in Neil, Paul Nelson uh, proposing a hospital that was never built. Uh, the translation here for cité is not city, unfortunately, it means complex. It's uh, a little difficult from the French to the English. Uh, but it's uh, meant to be this integrated, uh, complete hospital uh, that is designed like a city rather than uh, just a single building. And so the, trans the, the transfer of people around this, the movement of cars, the separation of people and cars and services becomes all part of the science of these models hospitals. And while it's hard to see here uh, the Sotiukasit or Southern Hospital by Sidestrom uh, in, uh, in Stockholm uh, is also a, a city-based hospital. These very, very large complexes designed uh, to accommodate a very large number of patients. And indeed we see the passing of innovation uh, from the, uh, from Europe through Australia and then finally back to the United States where uh, the very modern design of hospitals starts to come in post-World War II. Here we see uh, the Fort Hamilton Veterans Administration Hospital in Brooklyn uh, completed in 1952 with the uh, position of cars becoming very important, this drop-off. But you can see a very functional designed hospital. What's missing from this hospital, and I just go back to some of these examples, uh, it's a little difficult to see on this one, but this one has a whole series of balconies on the back of it. Uh, so does uh, this hospital and this hospital, all balconies. But when we get to Fort Hamilton, the balconies have disappeared. And the reason for that is that spread of air conditioning out from places like the morgue and the uh, operating theatre to the entire hospital that becomes a closed system. As they close up, air condition all the air, um, they clean the air, and they don't want anything coming in from outside. And that whole thing about air conditioning uh, becomes a science in itself. But the effect on the outside of the building is that it closes the hospital into uh, a particular uh, hermetically sealed box, uh, one that patients no longer engage or move through to the outside. They're in this hygienic space that has to be kept uh, clean. Architecture steps away perhaps from being an instrument of therapy at that point in time uh, and more of a container of therapies. We also see at this time uh, the invention of a whole series of drug-based therapies such as penicillin, uh, uh, use of various vaccines, and so treatment moves from being something that is done to the patient, to the body, to treatment that is done under the skin. Uh, so the need for the body to be manipulated through physiotherapy, hydrotherapy, that's water therapy, heliotherapy, which is sun therapy, uh, is lessened and they're more likely to be treated intravenously uh, with uh, some kind of drug. Again, that means the implications for the design of the hospital is that it just needs to contain that rather than be uh, a, a particular space designed to uh, facilitate those things. And the design of hospitals uh, post-World War II becomes a very, very specialist thing. Hospitals get regarded as systems, and we see uh, system-type hospitals uh, being designed. This one, uh, the Benjamin Franklin Campus Clinic uh, by Arthur Q. Davis of Curtis Davis. Uh, and the, it's of interest that the, the decorative screen is actually an abstraction of vertebrae, so of the spine. And we see really long corridors, uh, these connected ways of thinking about the hospital. It becomes a process, the built, the built uh, realisation of a process uh, rather than a place that cares for the patient itself. 
the patient is just one unit to move efficiently through these systems. And therefore, the designs of these buildings become much more systems-based. You can see here the Nuffield Transplantation Surgery Unit. Uh, it's not about views to the outside. It's not about care for the patient. It's about this system of very, very um, efficient uh, spaces. That happens no more uh, than a place like this, the McMaster University Health Sciences Centre uh, of 1967 to 72, which was literally a plug-in and plug-out design uh, where every space was ultimately flexible, uh, things could be moved and changed in the hospital, <coughs> but the patients, the care of the patients, their well-being is perhaps uh, not in any of the design of this. Fascinating from an architectural point of view, not so nice to be a patient. Either. And this is part of the problem. Hospitals at this time became very unfriendly to their patients and patients didn't like what was happening as they got larger and larger, uh, more system-like, more about the efficiency of delivering medical care rather than thinking about the patient themselves. 